The following episode of the Blacklist Exposed podcast was recorded based on a pre-release copy of the Blacklist, Season 8, Episode 21, titled Nachalo. At no time during the watching of the episode nor the taping of this podcast were the hosts of this podcast harmed in any way. All dialogue you hear tonight from the hosts is strictly their opinion. Some of those opinions have been held since Season 1 of the show. If you have not watched Nachalo, please stop now. This is your only spoiler warning. Listener and subscriber discretion is advised. Hey guys, this is John Bokenkamp, writer of episode 821, Nachella. This is a big one. You're listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Men and women, Cold War nests, secret bus stops, women and men, mass hysteria. Welcome to the award-winning The Blacklist Exposed podcast. Greetings one and all. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I am Agent Aaron Peterson. Anybody else think the nickname Red was a bit on the nose or hair, as it were? I don't know. Uh, I'm also here to eat a delicious helping of humble pie, so won't you join me? Thanks for joining us yet again for The Blacklist is We uh, discuss... Nashalo, Nashalo. <laughs> How do you say it, Troy? Nashalo. Thank you, Nashalo, aka the beginning, written by series creator John Bokenkamp and directed by Kurt Kenny. If you haven't yet, don't forget to listen to our exclusive interview with John Bokenkamp that now lives in your podcast feeds. This is your one and only spoiler warning for this episode. If you have not seen 821, Nashalo. Yeah, I'm gonna keep saying it like that. Uh, do not listen any further, as it will ruin eight seasons of the Blacklist for you potentially or maybe it's all a dream i don't know somebody might wake up in the shower the next episode we don't know show notes that are intel for this episode of the blacklist exposed can be found at the and do want to say thank you to our patreon supporters because because of your generosity and your help and your supporting the show we are officially on youtube for this episode yes we are live and in color we are sporting blacklist shirts we are sporting our fedora more like Don Juan type hats because we're cool and we can just wear whatever hats we want, but we have hats on and it's awesome. And we're going to have a blast tonight because if you are new to the podcast, this is a podcast like you've never going to hear before because we're going completely off the rails people this evening. We're going to do the format completely different. We're going to do all of the special agent Intel next week, actually, because we are recording this as you heard at the top of the show uh, before the episode is actually aired. So we could get this episode out immediately following the show because I know you want to hear our thoughts and theories. So we'll take all your thoughts on this episode and all your thoughts on the ending next week. And we'll do all the special agent intel next week because I think that we have a lot to discuss, a lot to dissect, a lot of uh, artistry, imagery, and interpretation ahead of us on the show this evening. But before we get to any of that, we did have a... Just so you know, I'm just clarifying. I am drinking. We are celebrating. Hello. Yeah, that's that's what the word is. Yeah, celebrating. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, we are at the penultimate episode of season eight. It's been a fantastic season so far, and it's made fantastic by all of you, the fans that listen to the show, because we do this thing called the profiling question of the week. We had one two weeks ago when those bunker doors opened. We were all like, <gasps> what is the blacklist? What's down there? And what did the fans have to say, Aaron? <laughs> well, we asked what will be what we find in the bunker. Neil said Desmond is pressing the button in there. Uh, I lost reference. I get that. Wait, I didn't get. I didn't get my commission for that one. <laughs> yeah, I think. I think. Troy, and because you're new to the show, Troy gets paid for every time we say every that. single time. Yep. Uh, Rob said it was the Hydra Station. If you're a Marvel fan, I actually thought that for a second. I'm like, what? If, what if? What if the Doc's down there? What if? Uh, <laughs> what if Toby Jones is down there? Uh, Steve, sorry, I'm in a hurry. I want to get to this freaking episode. Steven, the computer from 2001: A Space Odyssey, and Red's real name is Dave. Wouldn't it be Hal? <laughs> That seems kind of interesting, right? <laughs> like, hello, Dave. How are you, Dave? <laughs> because Hal was the computer, wasn't it? Hal was the computer, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Simone said, hundreds and hundreds of filing cabinets full of information and Tadashi sitting in the corner asking Red for a better computer than the 1980s Commodore 64 that he's been working on because that's what he was forced to work with. It's actually, that one's not too far off. It's not too far off. It was pretty close. pretty close. Wendy Davies, Ziggy from Quantum Leap, helping Red righting the wrongs. Uh, <laughs> That's I miss funny. Quantum Leap. I got a couple more. Quantum Leap is a fantastic show. 
Really good show. Uh, William Robert Kent Corset said, The souls of those who canceled Timeless, Manifest, and Debris at NBC. Mm. It's, that hurts, right? It sure does. <laughs> Meanwhile, Blacklist just keeps on going. <laughs> How's that make you feel, fans? <laughs> they love it. They love the show. And my favorite one, Nick Romano, the statue of Glenn. The door is open. Oh, and Glenn is there. You know, I think that even if there wasn't a statue of Glenn, Glenn would have actually found this place and put one there just to mess with Red. <laughs> All right. Well, the question for next week, our profiling question. Okay. So posing it to you, the listeners, the fans of the show. Do you believe, do you believe, not what your friends think, not what your grandma thinks, not what your dad thinks. Not what we think. Do you believe? Yeah, not what we think. Because, yeah, well, I don't even know what I think anymore. Do you believe that the theory that Red is Katerina Rostova was confirmed on this episode? Yes or no? It's a yes or no question. It's not a maybe. It's not a let me think about it. Yes or no? Do you think it was confirmed on this yeah. episode? Not this This uh, information says yes. This information says no. Take a stance once and for all. Do you yep. say con confirmation this week or not confirmation? You decide, and we will all find out next week what the fans think. But before Red torches us to death, Let's go ahead and get to this week's case profile. And I'll keep drinking. Okay. <laughs> so as Joy alluded to earlier, we're doing this dip episode a little differently. We're going to break things down in a different manner. Instead of breaking down the characters like we normally would, we are instead breaking down the timeline. Red, Liz, Katarina, etc. We're breaking down the truth. But first, the music. What music did we hear this week? Did we hear anything? Yeah, we only had one track this week uh, as we mm. were introduced to the young version of Created Red. Yep. We have to be careful like how we say this tonight, too. There's Raymond Reddington, then there's Red that we've known and love, and then there's like Created Red, and then there's like, I don't know, it's all kinds of confusing, but we'll work through it. But this is when we hear Created Red in a younger state, post-transformation, we hear it's a man's, man's, man's world by James Brown. Uh, we were also treated to hearing the Jingle Bell song when we saw the Christmas tree scene from the Luther Braxton episode, and I believe the music box waltz was also heard at one point during the episode as well. Uh, and of course, you of can get the, great, uh, the James Brown song over on the playlists, both Spotify and Apple Music. We have links to those on our website, theblacklistexposed.com, uh, and you can hit all the great music from all the seasons, not just season eight, but all the way from the beginning. It's all out there. We got a lot to talk about. I don't even know where to start, but here we go. What we're going to do is we're going to break down the timeline as we talked about. So we're going to go like step by step by step, because would you agree that this episode was basically an exposition bomb? Uh, <laughs> I, I, we just got done on a movie oh. podcast previous to this. And I was like, man, I really hated this movie that I watched because it was all exposition. But yet in the case <laughs> of this, I really liked all the exposition on this one. I love the, way Kirk Kenny did the camera as he's moving around and showing people in a circle like Liz's head is spinning with the information she's receiving because that's kind of how we all felt as we were receiving mm -hmm. the information like oh my god oh my god oh my god what, where's, what does this mean what's it gonna happen well yes and no I mean you gotta admit that a lot of the stuff we had figured out ahead of time some of the stuff you had figured out yeah yeah, yeah we'll get there but a lot of the stuff we've <laughs> we've talked about ad nauseum in the past so we we knew a lot of this stuff I would say we we, 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 we did. Crazy right? dedicated fans had made this assumption. Yes. Yeah, I said, if, if you're like a Blacklist watcher, there's probably like 10% of the audience that was like, yep, 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 mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. Okay, great. Thanks for confirming everything I already knew. There's probably 40% of the fans who were like, oh, oh yeah, I can totally see that. Sure, yeah, it comes totally. together. Yeah. I get it. All right. And then there's 50% of the people who are like chucking their TVs out the window. <laughs> there's definitely a large component that I that's the only downside like I, I really wish I knew how the reaction was going to be and if people are, are kind of as one-sided to this as I as I think we're going to be you know yeah, I, I, I wonder if people are going to come at it and be like no 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 because you do have a third guy I mean there there is a little bit of interpretation I think for sure I just don't know how much you want to read into that well since I need to get paid for this week so the what I like about this is that the, ch the choice they made to do the interpretive view. That means a lost reference is coming, right? Right. Is that, <laughs> is that 
when you do an interpretive view, I mean, you can even do it with like, um, like it was Inception with the, with the spinning top. Giving an answer almost ruins the art at the end of the day. I mean, there were people that were upset with Lost that it didn't give an answer of like, what's the island and what is it doing? And da, 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 da. But at the same time, it's like, you don't really want the answer because you want to be able to say 10 years later, Troy's still talking about that damn show. And we kind of want that for the blacklist. You know, 10 years from now, you want people to be still talking about Raymond Reddington and all the great stories and all the don't Liz agree. eye rolls. And, disagree with that completely. You know, I mean, because then the show lives in infamy, right? It, it's, the, it's always out there. It's something that people always remember because they talk about the interpretation and they debate the interpretation ad nauseum for the rest of their lives. And that's what makes the, that would keep the blacklist alive even after it's long off the air. I, I don't think so. I, I think actually you're, and you, we've seen it. We've seen it as fans of the show of doing this podcast. I think pe fans were really getting fed up with not getting that answer, with not getting more information, with not getting the details. We've talked about it every week forever. I appreciate because now you feel a little redeemed in some way that you're, you're taking this kinder, gentler stance. <laughs> But I, I, I think it was definitely time. It's time. It was time to put these issues to bed. People were getting tired of the back and forth. They want to just focus on blacklisters. They want to just focus on Red Reddington stories and whatever's going on and, and their life. Like, that's what they want to do. And by the way, we should mention, yes, we're fully aware of industry news <laughs> that's breaking in regards to certain members of the cast. We're going to wait until the finale to touch that. So it's not like we're ignoring it. It's not like we aren't acknowledging that it exists we're staying away from it until the series finale so we kind of can see what sh what direction the show is going okay because it is coming back for season nine so just yeah. we should back that out and if you don't know what the hell we're talking about just stay off the internet for another week and then you'll know next yeah. week if, if you don't know by now you're doing a pretty good job already yeah you don't yeah. need our help to spoil it for you like the rest of us were um, <laughs> exactly son of a bitch what but exactly no, but no I, this this was a heavily this was a heavy exposition episode and you know, I'm always not a fan of that to me. Whenever you got to do an exposition dump, it's like, well, maybe you should have like put the pieces out there to begin with. I here, I would say all of these pieces, the majority of the pieces were out there. So it's more of, it's not so much an exposition. It is a here, we're going to go back through what you already know, remind you of it. We're going to do it in this creatively wild way that if you really look at it in a show context, doesn't make sense. Like who is Liz talking to this whole time? If you really like, is she talking to red? Like she's just, did he stop time? Did, did his words have stopped? Did that trigger her mind? Is that how he triggers her memories? You know, how does that work? What, you know, what is this? I think we just have to accept that this is the way that they built it into the episode, the way John built it into the episode so they could do an exposition heavy episode and remind people of the things they already know, fill in the gaps and get to the end the reason why the typewriters and all the analog technology was in the in this place the nest uh it was because the rhythm of that sound made it a hypnotic state for anybody that went in there and it's in that hypnotic state that suggestions could be done to do the memory wipes and whatever else potentially i'm just being facetious now <laughs> yeah now you're just being weird so i i really love the visual style so the visual I will, style will go great. on record and say it that. what's that yeah, it was great yeah, Kirk did an amazing job getting the visual style out there with the black and white. And we know that from the interview from John that it was, you know, uh, Spader's idea to do the black and white, kind of a document. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it just, it, it worked brilliantly. And I was actually kind of impressed that it wasn't like, the, I was expecting after we, we talked to John last week, that was the whole episode. So I really liked the seamless transition from 820 into 821. You get a little bit of color in the front end. And then you get that like, kind of like, whoosh, like really... <laughs> weird pulled out of time almost and this is where the time traveler theory people are going to come up um but almost pulled out of time, time travel there's time travel theory people there are time travel theory people they literally what? thought this was like a stargate downstairs or some kind of uh, time travel device i mean i know there's people that say well if she made a clone i'm like oh if you go there i just don't want anything to do with it i don't, <laughs> I don't see clone as an option but to each their own enjoy your theory yeah, the time but, uh, travel. I don't want anything to do with time. You know, I hate time travel. No, I time just travel. I'm not a fan. It's good in certain shows, but not in the show. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, I think that 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 maneuver was great. And then the fact that it ends the episode back in the real time, so you still get that transition from 821 into 822 to finish up the Townsend story and what's going to happen based on the you know outcomes of what happened here down in the you know super secret 20 megaton bomb you know safe, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's just get into it. Let's go little by little until we get to the meat. You good with that? I'm good with that. Let's rock it. Okay. So the tracker was indeed still broadcasting and Townsend does show up at the nest, but not before Red shares a magnum opus of a Red story with Liz. Like the biggest Red story he's ever told. Or is he telling it? We don't know because I mean, Katarina tells stuff, Reddington tells stuff, Ilya tells stuff. Everybody's got, everybody's got their own narration. I don't know who's actually telling Liz the story. Like I said earlier, w- would you agree that it's just, that's the narrative choice they use to get through this without it being annoying and too heavy? Well, I think if you didn't do it this way, the only other person that could be telling the story at this point would be Red. Maybe Dembe throws in a couple side conversations and then you would you would have the thing that we all hate is literally 30 minutes of red just giving exposition that's kind of boring so even though red tells some amazing stories but like the schrodinger's cat story the whole like cab thing like we were all like oh my god is he still going on about the cat and the cab and everything <laughs> like this is the longest red story ever uh, so i appreciated the way that they did the transition to do the characters themselves telling their parts of the story in a way that was easy for fans to understand i think yeah, I did too. I was, I was a big fan of that. And, you know, once you, once it starts going, you kind of roll with it. It's just, okay, all right, I can, I can, I can dig this. And I like the black and white aesthetic. I don't know if it was necessary, but it, it made a, for a cool effect. I mean, I think it was flashy and it was interesting. So I like that. I did too. So the nest is an analog site that prints currency in the form of information that continue to be built over time, starting with the original 13 pieces of information from the Sikorsky archive. What do you what do you feel about that aspect? Because that's basically that is the blacklist. We finally know what the black answers. We did get answers. We got tons of answers. We're gonna touch each one of them as we go. Yeah, I think this was a really creative way to because you always wondered like from the beginning, it's like, well, how does Red know all these criminals? And you can say, Well, it's been twenty years, you know, he's worked with these people, I'm sure he's made friends, he's made enemies, so he's got this thing. This was a really interesting way to say, Hey, we have this intel. How can we take the intel and turn the intel into tradable commodity to get more intel and more intel and more intel? And then we start building up files on people, powers of industry or captains of industry, um, you know, world powers, countries, etc. I, I just think this is really cool because it's a different take on the standard cabal or secret organization concept that we've seen in other shows that have been done by John Eisendrath, like Alias. Um, I think this was a really great concept and a way to put it forward to explain what was the blacklist. Still don't know like why the numbers were in the order the numbers were in. We didn't get that answer in particular, but at least the way Red got his information, I thought was really creative. And uh, I, I bought it and I kind of liked the, the, the reveal. It was really good. All right, we go to Elizabeth. Stop. Time stops. Red says, right now there's only you and me and the truth. And this is the part where you start hearing different voices and she starts hearing her mother's voice and things are kind of getting a little hazy, getting confused. You hear the story you need to hear. It's all connected. And then bam, we're into it. Now, one question I want to ask you before we get into all these answers and whatnot, is there any part of you that wishes this would have been more spread out throughout the season as opposed to dumped in one episode? That's a really great question. I would have liked to have seen, like, I love the, um, the appearances of, um, Stepanov. I liked seeing a lot of her beak back as Katarina, um, even though they had the new actor, right. Um, for, for Dom, I think it would have been cool to actually see some of this acted out mm-hmm. in a more episodic fashion, like a Rasviet or a Requiem type of event, and then have it all recapped for Liz, maybe in the next episode. Um, just cause. I think the actors are really good and um, especially Brett Cullen, right. As Ilya and then uh, Gabriel Mann playing the young Ilya. I think a lot of the, the, the actors were like doing some really great stuff because it felt like, and, and again, like we'll go back to John's interview last week. He talked about filming in a COVID world and the fact that they could use a lot of the previous shots that they've already filmed uh, in the past episodes and bring those back in like, Oh, Hey, remember this from Rossfield. Hey, oh, Hey, remember this from Requiem. I, I think that was a great way that they could keep the budget, low it's a great way they could do it and keep people safe um so i get the concepts and the ideas and the filming structure on how they were able to create the episode to do that versus having to shoot something completely brand new 
So from that reason, I respect the choice. Um, but I would have liked to have seen more of a dramatic play versus the exposition reused footage concept personally. Yeah, me as well. Me as well. I, I just feel like I'm glad we got the answers finally. I think we could have had more confirmation over the years. And maybe that could have staved off a, a few of the outrages that we've had in the fan com <laughs> community about wanting answers. Well, here we go. Katarina was trained to be a spy by Dom. She grew up as the son her father would never have. Hmm. And my mother understood me. She knew I wanted to follow a different path, but of course Dom wanted her to be a spy. I think that's important. You know, as we go, there are little, little seeds here. There are, there are some planted seeds. So she worked as a spy as a child. Spying was literally in her DNA. So now we know a little bit more about Ken. I think we already knew that there's really nothing new here, except for she grew up as a son. Her father would never have. And my mother understood me. You know, she knew I wanted to follow a different path. Those are more, pointed comments than we've heard before. So I think that kind of paints a little bit of a, a different picture, but I think we can hold that and come back to it. Well, and I think that's an important line too, because that the, my mother understood me because that harkens back to season six, episode 12, I think was the death row scene, because that's the same information that red told Liz about how his father never understood him and how his mother understood him. And this was his mother's meal that he made. And we all thought, oh, Red's Russian because he's eating, you know, cabbage soup and all that fun stuff. So they're pulling information that you've seen previously in the show, reiterating that information from a different character's point of view. Mm -hmm. We'll come back. <laughs> I wonder if everybody is still listening or if half of our audience has stopped. I don't know. We'll have to keep going and find out. We'll find out. Maybe Stepping they're stuck off, in Frozen in Time and someone else is talking to them doing the podcast. Stepanoff was her handler and became one of the most important men of her life. So uh, we know that much information. I think we already knew that. Yeah, we, one we could call him a friend, that. potentially. What's that? Is that one could call him a friend. Yeah, right? one could he call was, him a he friend. Was, sure. He was Katarina's friend. One of her oldest friends. So she was forced to sleep with men and women alike, to be lost in her own identity, to procure secrets for her homeland, Mother Russia. And her father even handpicked her husband. So she marries Constantine uh, Rostova because her dad tells her to. Yeah. And then and that's an and, interesting. Go, 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 go go well, yeah, I was just, I think it's interesting that like, what was the angle? Like, what was it about Constantine Rostov that Dom and those people wanted to get information out of him for? Uh, because he was obviously Russian, not American, even though he eventually became an American businessman down the line um, as Alexander Kirk. But I, I, that's a part that I'm like, oh, that'd be real. That's an interesting story. I'd love to know why Constantine was the target. Like, that's something I'd like to hear more on. Me too. But if you watch the show uh, Banshee, you see where Kirk went after this show. You know, that's the way I'm looking at it. He went and he became a huge thug in the small town. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. So has an affair with Raymond Reddington, also chosen by Dom. Once again, American spy trying to, you know, use him for information. Now Raymond is speaking. So it changes a little bit. So you can't really say Red was speaking as Katarina. I want to point that out because I think it's an important factor because some people are going to say, well, you see, the transition is that it goes from Red to Katarina. That's bam, bam, bam. Look right there. That's that's money in the bank. That's confirmation. Oh, my gosh. It's like, not because it's every not. character gets time to speak. Would you agree with that at least? 100%. Yeah, I think okay. it was great how they had, you know, in this case, switching over to OG Raymond Reddington, naval officer, Mary to Carla, father of Jennifer. I think it was great to hear those events of that Raymond Reddington's life from Raymond Reddington himself. I think that's a really great choice, and it was great to actually see the character for the first time in the show at this moment. Well, that leads to Baby Masha, because the affair with Raymond leads to Baby Masha. And, you know, the next two years were a blur. But Dom says, hey, Tell, tell Rostov, tell Constantine, that baby's his. We're going to use this because he'll be so happy. We'll use this to his advantage. So the whole time he's thinking Masha is his child. The next two years are a blur. Like they said, everything about me was pretend. Well, that's a nice little callback to Troy. Everything about me is a lie I would, from the I pilot. Agree. You might see sense of pattern. Like we're just, we're just pointing it out. I'm not having an opinion just yet. It's a whole type. All right, Troy, now this is an important aspect because this is where Liz starts to phase out of it a little bit. And then Red says, no, Liz, stay with the story. So, Troy, things are getting a little complicated. Why don't you take it from here? 
Yeah. So at this point in time, two years have passed, and now Katarina is deeply embedded with Raymond Reddington, the naval intelligence officer married to Carla, Carla father of Jennifer. And he, she is still obviously madly in love with Constantine, faking it, of course, with a daughter that Constantine thinks is his. So she actually gets involved with the cabal, uh, Alan Fitch and company, and all the people that we've come to know and love over the years. And she has been spying on Raymond Reddington, the naval officer, at the Tacoma house. I don't know if everybody caught this, but when she's looking out the window while she's holding baby Masha, talking to Raymond Reddington, the naval officer, and Bubble Girl is out of the window, Bubble Girl is obviously Jennifer, if you mm -hmm. remember Bubble Girl from the home movies, which I think is an interesting take because now you know that at the Tacoma house that you have Katarina. He, 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 he torched. He torched, yeah. The yep. one he torched, he said he raised his family here and there were bad memories and all of that stuff. And one of the, the theories that was out there was that he never raised a family there. It was just a story that he told Lou Lee because Lou Lee didn't know the answer like Dembe did. So this was like one act of cleaning up the past so that nobody would be able to find Masha, Elizabeth, and or Katerina because obviously Katerina was still alive and in the wind. And so therefore, this was one step to make sure that that protection stayed intact because this is a place that people could find answers if they ever found the house. Well, and you can make the argument that Katarina was raising a family there. I mean, to a degree. And you could say that Raymond Reddington was raising a family there. Like there's a, you could say that, but I get what you're, I concede. Yeah. I mean, if you were, if you didn't want to use that as a definitive marker for a particular theory, you this could one say, feels more open than other ones. So yeah, it I does. Could, yeah. yeah. Or you could say, yeah, absolutely. Like you were saying, like if you believe in a certain theory, then this makes sense. If you believe in another theory, it also makes sense. That's the beauty of the blacklist is that there's a lot of interpretation you can take in this episode to make a couple theories probably work. Mm. I think there's one that probably leans probably more heavily um, than some others after watching this episode. But I think that there's three ways you could take this particular scene. You could say that Raymond, if Raymond Reddington is truly Raymond Reddington and the bones were fake, then yes, he raised his family here. If you're saying that this Raymond Reddington is Katerina Rostova, the Red Arena theory, then yes, she did raise a family here. Um, or it could just be a story and Raymond Reddington is the third person that we haven't met yet because he was created by Ilya and Katerina. Sure. Okay. Continue, sir. All right. Well, then uh, they're all hanging out at the Tacoma house and everybody is fine until Raymond Reddington, naval officer, father of... Jennifer suspects Katarina is spying on him. So he spies back on her as he needs evidence <laughs> and then learns of the cabal creates the fulcrum and the key to getting back at Katarina and exposing the cabal, basically giving himself an insurance policy. And then of course, being able to save his daughter, Elizabeth, her American name, Masha being her Russian name, uh, obviously hides the key in the bunny. Well, then Katarina finds out about all this and brings Ilya and another man to the house to find the fulcrum. It's and this is point. the night of the fire. A, there is a third man there. There is a third man there. Yeah. Um, they come to the house and Raymond hides Elizabeth in the closet and there's only one kid. There isn't two kids. So we got an answer there that there's no two kid theory. Um, hides Liz in the closet. You see the navel ring uh, on his hand, just like we saw in Luther Braxton back in season two, closes the door, says, stay here. And then obviously things escalate. Ilya knocks over a flammable item to start the fire at the beach house. And then in the confusion, Masha obviously thinking that dad is hurting mom and probably a little bit mad that dad kidnapped her for mom, picks up the gun and shoots and kills Raymond Reddington there. And he doesn't die right away. He actually gets pulled out of the fire by Katarina yeah. and Ilya to the car yeah, and dies tight. somewhere else. Hang tight with that one. Um, you got it. I do want to ask you in terms of that, like I was watching that and it was an interesting dynamic because you get Masha holding the gun and she's very, obviously she's erratic. She's upset. She's it's her dad and her mom fighting. I don't know who she was aiming the gun at because it could have been either one. It could have been either one. Yeah. I don't know who she was aiming to kill. I know she killed her father, obviously that we, we know that that's confirmed. It's been confirmed for a long time, but watching that moment, I don't know who, she was really angry or worried about most at that, at that moment, which I thought was interesting. And then when you get into the whole memory wipe manipulation concept, I think what's really interesting there is that, you know, we, we know that Katarina was the one that 
did do the memory wipe. We got that confirmation here in the episode later on. And so because of that, you're wondering, well, she wiped it all, right? So she wiping not only the fact that she killed her father, but also the fact that she might have also been able to kill her mother. And that's why she decided to do the memory wipe because of exactly what you said. You don't know who she was aiming at. She just pulled the trigger. Right. Interesting stuff. I love it. Well, um, and the, you were burned. We both were. You know, that was an interesting thing. Like Liz is saying, well, you were burned. And she said, oh, we both were. Now, I'll, I'll come back to that when you finish this portion out, though. All right. Well, uh, they go through the, the beach house. It's on fire. They're in the car. Masha runs back inside uh, to get her stuffed bunny, which does have the fulcrum sewn into it, as we find out later on in Luther Braxton. And then uh, Katarina goes back into the house to try to find him. Liz, uh, Ilya's in there trying to find him. And, of course, then we have the whole... I was burned, you were burned. So the question becomes, when you think about Requiem and seeing her show up at the hotel with uh, Kaplan, do you think that the show did enough to actually point you in a direction to think that the burns on Red's back no. No. versus that versus this conversation, do you think that ties? No, that's, that's uh, what, are, what are the kids called? That's weak sauce right there. Let me tell you, because uh, <laughs> if, you go back, if you go back and rewatch that particular episode and we we speculated like crazy about it at the time because we're like you know red has burns on his back do those match up because of the red arena theory do those match up it's barely a hole i mean i don't know if you went back and rewatched it but it's it's barely a hole now unless she changed clothes and for some reason she's she's a very attractive woman she's so hot she burned a hole through her shirt i guess that's possible seems extreme but you never know or maybe she was escaping a volcano and a and a piece of lava hit her right there in that spot. That might justify and explain that tiny little spot. But nothing that we saw in that episode showed extensive third degree burns that would leave scars for life. You know what I'm saying? Like it just it just didn't play to me based on the episode. I'm not saying it couldn't be there. It just seemed uh, very minor that from what we saw. But at least we know one thing. So the burns on the back are going to be one thing I think coming out of this episode from the end of season one that might still be like a hangover kind of feeling for the show. It could be very much a thing that goes against your red arena theory though. If you really think about it, because you've got the third guy that's there and Katarina obviously in the episode we saw her in has a very, very minor burn. It's like, I'm seriously, I just rewatched it. So you're not going to tell me any different. It was tiny. (laughs) So I think there's two schools of thought here. Uh, School thought number one would be, because people would say like, well, if she transitioned, right, she became Raymond Reddington and, and gave up the Katarina life, then why would she not just get that fixed? Because you got to go through all this plastic surgery to make the change happen. Why wouldn't you get that fixed? I think you get the answer to that, why she wouldn't have gotten it fixed based on the fact that the scar on Liz's hand was so important that it was a memory that he built this yeah. entire enterprise off of it, that he'd want to keep that same scar on himself as a reminder Reminds her of that night of that night. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one way you can go about it. Second way you could go about it is say like, maybe that burn at the end of season one is just a MacGuffin. Like it's there. People are going to hang on it. People are going to think about it. But remember we did meet at blacklister called the cook and the cook apologized to Raymond Reddington saying like, Oh, I'm really sorry that fire wasn't supposed to happen that you weren't blah, blah, blah. And then red shushes them. Like, sh- like don't talk about that. Like the burn could have been from that event. And has nothing to do with any of the mythology whatsoever. That feels like a leap, though. If you, if to stick with your theory, if if that's what you're going to hang your your hat on, uh, I think I think that's a stretch. I do. I think it's a stretch to get to that. You can't have one without the other. Is what I'm saying. I think so too. I, I would agree with you. But yeah, the whole the whole. Um, but see, it's like it's 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 like John was saying. Like, do you how much do you leak out? Especially when you're talking season four at that point. You know, and you know you have a seven-year plan potentially. That like, do you like have her sweater completely destroyed? Does that not just give the answer away in season four? I mean, it's it's kind of a cop you can't out. Can't shortchange it though. But you can't, you can't shortchange, shortchange it. it. You, right. You, you can't. You know, I understand, but she didn't have to have a burn hole at all. She could have just said, you know, I had to change my shirt because of the fire. You know, it got singed or something like that. whatever she could say. There's a way to play around that totally. by having the burn hole in there. That now I didn't go back and actually watch that episode after this one, just to see if the shirt matched specifically exactly. But we saw, we saw the fire. We didn't see the, after the fire, I guess. Um, but 
you can't shortchange that moment. So if you're going to have the whole, it should have been the whole thing. Like whatever it's going to be, that sh- that should be relayed to us in that moment. Now I feel or, bad. Or nothing at all. Or nothing at all. Because it's going to be one of those things that people are going to go back and go, oh, I'm going to go watch Requiem to see what shirt she was wearing. Yep. And did the costume department actually have that same shirt on her in the back of the car when she was holding Raymond Reddington in her lap and making sure and then Masha runs back in the house. So was that shirt on her at that time? Because then, you know, that's going to be one of those like after the show ends, like writer's room things where they're like, oh, yeah, now she changed shirts at the Target down the street <laughs> on the way to the hotel. <laughs> you get some yeah. interview 10 years later at the ATX Film Festival or something. That's that's not going to play for me, for me personally. But so it's a minor detail, but it is a big detail. In the scheme of things, that that is a big detail. I agree. Like that's one that will be stuck in there in the craw of the show and people will be like, Oh, like that one thing. How do we miss the one thing? We'll finish with the Cape May stuff and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more here. Yeah. So at this point then, uh, Katerina obviously had Liz's memories erased. Katerina takes Masha to Kate Kaplan at the motel. She goes to Cape May. She fights for her life solo. People always thought that there were maybe two people at Cape May helping her out in the flashback sequences we saw in this episode tonight. Um, she's literally fighting everybody solo. So the little flashlight from the from the bushes was actually somebody signaling one of the other guys that was there. My opinion, my interpretation. Um, and then she obviously goes in the ocean, comes back out, finds Ilya. We grew up together. That's an important line because we heard that from the beginning that they grew up together. And then, of course, hatches the plan to become Raymond Reddington. Ilya is the one that actually was the one that went to the bank. That was a cool reveal. Um, so he goes without any surgery or procedures or anything. He just goes in and says, I'm Raymond Reddington and cleans out all the funds because nobody knew what Raymond Reddington looked like at that point. Um, and apparently still sounds like Jane Spader. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the overlay audio was still pretty cool. I don't know how they managed to pull that one off again. Yeah, um, that was, uh, that was a little interesting. I'm like, okay, so now you're saying it was Ilya, but he sounded like Spader when he sat down. And that was obviously the first time he'd been in that bank. So, you know, that's one where I'm like, eh, now you're stretching it. You're stretching the laws of credibility a little bit here. Which, which we did have a disclaimer at the top of the episode here that we did see a pre-release copy. So maybe that was cleaned up in the official final version that they would have changed it to Ilya's voice rather true, than Reddington's possible. voice. Sure, so it's, it's true. possible. possible. So we'll, we'll, we'll watch the actual cut and then we'll, we'll, we'll find out if that's the case or not. Um, but that Ilya realizes that that's not going to work, right? So more drastic measures are needed. So Ilya and Katarina created Reddington, a rebirth of sorts, if you will. Now, what did you think about that? Because, you know, now you get confirmation. And I, like we've, we've said, and John has, has confirmed, if you see it on screen, you know, that was my big, when we talked about Ross Viet, that was my, my big takeaway. You know, a lot of people were making the argument that Dom could be lying. The whole story could be BS, right? The whole story could be a lie. And my argument was at the time, very adamantly, anything we actually see happen on screen happened, you know? Anything Liz says, that's Liz's interpretation. That's the way she sees it. But if we see it happen on screen, that happened. That's the way it happened. And that turns out to be confirmed here. John has said that. He said that after the, when we interviewed him that season. But it's also reiterated here. So I, I am of the opinion, everything in this episode that we saw, we can take as verbatim. A hundred percent. hundred percent. And I think that the interesting concept of the there was the third man at the fire that was helping people out. It's you know, an important thing to point out, man, because he had like short, short, close, uh, close cropped hair, very much like he was balding, um, had the stubble. You know, he looks a little bit like Raymond Reddington currently. But then a the other people version. that would have known about this flip flop of the how to create a Reddington would have been Ilya and Katarina. So the conversation then switches to, you know, did they talk to a third party? Was there a third party that became Reddington? Because that's where you have the whole transition of Liz going back to like, but who, who are you? Who are you? And back to right, back to reality. Um, so it's very interesting to see how that plays out. <laughs> the angry jump back to reality. Yeah, that was, I think we all saw that coming, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and, and I think we knew that we were never going to get the answer this evening of who is Raymond Reddington. We did get the answers of what is the relationship of Raymond Reddington Red to Elizabeth Keene. I think that was the answer we've all been kind of waiting for as well. And, and I think the other was heavily alluded to. 
Well, and I think that's the interpretation part, right? That's the spinning top. Of course, of like, course. Like James sure. said it himself at Comic Con in season one. Like you don't want to know who Raymond Reddington is. The mystery is what makes it so cool. And so you can keep going on believing what you want to keep going on believing. It just depends on how you want to interpret it. And that's what the blacklist is all about. All of the dialogue in the show has always been able to be taken two ways. So why not his identity? And that could just be something we talk about 10, 20, or 30 years down the road. Nope. That's not a, a this isn't like lost in that respect. I, it has to be resolved. Like period. Like I don't know a single fan, except maybe you who's making a wonderful case for it, but I don't know anybody that thinks at the end of the day, whenever this thing wraps up, whatever you, 9, 10, 27, whatever the year is, this show finally wraps up. I don't know anyone besides Troy Heinrichs who doesn't want that confirmed 100%. That is like, I think, a big factor why so many people are still with the show is they want that confirmed one way or the other. So it doesn't, it, I, I don't agree with you at all. I don't think you can not ever answer that question. I, I think you would, you would be doing the fans a huge disservice by not answering that at some point. We agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an art. You also think the, uh, the last episode of Lost is magnificent. And it I wasn't. cry every time. It's beautiful. Yeah. Half of it was good. Half of it sucked. All right. So where are we at now? Well, now we, we know that uh, the rebirth happens. Right. But D Dom wasn't satisfied. Of course. Because this guy just, he's never happy. He's got to have it his way. It's got to be done his way. He, he's the bull in a china shop. You know what I mean? He's doing everything half-assed. So he wanted to protect his daughter and granddaughter at all costs. So with Ilya's help, they plan to frame Tatiana Petrova by leaking her picture to the KGB and powers that be, try to kill her in a car bomb at Belgrade, but her husband dies instead, sending Petrova on the run, helped by Red, to step, to stay one step ahead and until um, you know Liz got involved and, and all that happened. So... We learned that Red got involved after the fact because Red felt sorry for her, felt guilty about what happened to her, and wanted to keep her, you know, in good graces. Now, that's one where I would say, uh, well, for much of this part, up into this part, we have agreed that these are the things that happen for the most part, right? Like, we, we really, even though on the show we kind of have to go back and forth and look at all aspects and stuff, you know, when we, you and I have talked about this personally, we never thought that was really her mom. So this, this, and we've even talked about like, this seems to be what that picture was. You agree? Like there's nothing here that really took you by surprise. Yeah. Nothing that took us by surprise. And I, and I, the, the sad part about this one though, is that I'd like to pat ourselves on the back and saying like, yeah, we called that the minute the episode happened. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, like, we did. like you want me to kill your daughter? No, I want you to hear my plan. All right. Sounds good. That's a fake. All right. Set it up. We're good. Let's roll on. Um, but, Cause but we the, didn't see it. Cause we didn't but, see it. But I think the challenge here is, is that I only thought of that because I was trying to prove the other big theory. And if I didn't have the other big theory in the back of my mind, I don't know if I would have picked up on that the same way. I think you would have. Maybe not immediately, maybe in an episode or two, but because I would have been like other people. I'm like, oh, she's really, Kat Red called her Katarina. You know, that's got to be Katarina. Like, why, why well, would they bring Katarina in now? Like, I, I could have totally been bought into it had I not had the other theory in the back of my mind. To, to some degree, people wanted it to be Katarina. I can, I can speak, I'm speaking for my wife, right? She really wanted it to be Katarina because she's sick of hearing, is, it, is Katarina alive? Is Katarina dead? Is Red Katarina? Like, she's sick of hearing it. Like, it's not fun for her. She, she just wants to watch Blacklisters. And I know a lot of people that are very similar in that respect. They just want to watch and see the blacklister of the week. They don't care about this. And in, in, I'm only speaking for her. In her mind, it's a detriment to the show that they keep going forward with this mystery. Like they keep pushing it and pushing it and they're like dragging it out because it's been eight years. It's not something that, you know, lost six years, six seasons and many less episodes. So, you know, and that was already coming, that was already getting extremely thin. So I think there's a huge component to the fan fandom that just needs this wrapped up, this part portion wrapped up, because they just want to watch Blacklisters. They want it to be, you know, a CSI kind of show because it's been on for so long. It should be at this point. It should be Law and Order with Blacklisters. <laughs> you know, to, to, for many people, that's they just don't care about this. And it's not. I give them credit for dra for getting it done for eight years, but like we've talked about Troy. I mean, I don't know how many times we've talked about it. It was time to put the stuff to bed. It just was. Probably last year was 
you know, I think, what'd you say? Season six, season six would have been the perfect time to wrap that up. That, yeah, that yeah, portion of the story up and just do six and a half was the like starting point. Right. And then maybe six and a half to finish six out. The Townsend directive comes into play by end of seven. You should have had the mythology buttoned up. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. The extra eight, a season, I think is where you go. Oh, like, did we tear it on too long? Are we losing our mojo? Are we da, 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 da. I mean, that's something that, you know, you judge it out, you judge it after it's all done. And I think there's a lot of stuff this season that was good. There's a lot of stuff that the season felt uh, really did feel like filler. It was more of like a, a love letter throwback to season one in a way. Um, and sometimes that works like force awakens works great, right? It's just a retread of four in another bigger budget movie for seven. Um, sometimes it doesn't, you know, and I think this season, I think some people are going to like the season and some people are not going to like this season. I think what's great though, is that we're finally here and the answers feel validated. The answers feel earned. The answers feel like it's the right time because for Liz to get these answers, it's because her life is in great danger because of Townsend. But yeah, that could have I, been the season seven bad instead of focusing a whole year on Tatiana Petrova just because somebody was pissed off and wanted to blow her up. I, I just I feel like Liz the character got a disservice here because and and you and I talked about this by by it not being Katarina she did so much to try to go against Red which pissed the fans off obviously so they jumped it, you know immediately on Red's side and because he's been very loving to her even though I still say he's made her life hell but whatever. Um, so in her mind, you know, in her, in her mind, this is her mother that you killed and he could have easily solved this in episode four with, you know, sending a memo, you know, he's got, he's got this vast underground intelligence network. He could have done something to get the information to her that that wasn't really your mom, man. Like, and she, he kind of said it sure, but he also realized that she was completely convinced it was. So he needed to be more forceful with that information. So she understood it. So, you know, in, in a sense, we really had a good 15 episodes that didn't need to happen. Yeah. I mean, you could really go back and now that, you know, that Tatiana Petrova was actually a, you know, a, a stand in a fake, a fake arena, mm -hmm. right? Cause she had blonde hair, not red hair. Uh, but that, piece of the Tatiana, Tatiana Petrova story, I think you could have done in the first half of season seven, still get gunned down by uh, the brothers or whatever it was, you know, and just ended it there, right? Red could have hired the brothers. Liz could still be pissed off at red. You still have the red sure. versus Liz, sure. which triggers Townsend. And then the Townsend stuff is the last half of seven end of seven buttoned up beautiful bow. And we would have been in it, but COVID would have happened and we would have had the issues, but, but you, <laughs> you, you could have had the Townsend story this whole season be, one half of a season and shorten it up and just literally gone on on a high note at the end of seven, I think. Well, we are where we are. We are where we so, are. So Petrova sought out to prove that she wasn't Katarina or N13 to get Townsend off her back and ended up dying because of it, as well as Liz's grandfather, you know, because she, she used Liz and it led to his death. So here's my question. I mean, this is a legitimate question. How many people have to die to keep Liz safe? You know, I, I get the argument trying to keep Liz safe and everything else, but just think about, it. you know, um, Liz was talking about the character, the people that died in her life, Tom, Kaplan, Sam, Sam and Katarina, or Petrov. Dom. Dom. Yeah. And it keeps going and going and going. Tatiana obviously is part of that. Like she didn't need to die. She didn't do anything wrong. She's an innocent, really. Really? Innocent. She did some awful stuff, but you know, she's an innocent, but kind of had her, her hand forced, you know, at some point, Anne. Anne, Anne died, yep. At some point, we have to acknowledge, and I've said this before all season long, a lot of this is just on Red's plate. Like, how much death is worth saving this one person? How much? And if that death is really worth that much, then you have to start to ask yourself the question of only one, maybe two people would go through that much trouble to protect the child, potentially. <laughs> We're coming back to that. But I mean, also Ilya, Ilya died, you know, yep. for all this. Uh, did just, Ilya just, die? Yeah. Or did we just, did he disappear after he had the schizophrenic break? Well, Ilya died. He did Didn't die. He? I don't yeah. remember. It's been that a was long like, season. That was like, it has been a long season. Yeah. I think that was actually last season, to be quite honest. I think it was last season, but I'm pretty sure he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Stepanov lived. Stepanov is alive. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That one we know for sure. 
Maybe you should Google it. Try and make yourself feel better. All right. So how many people have to... I already talked about that. So I know you have to hide, but not for me. That's what Liz says to Vision, Katerina. I've made... Katerina says, I've made so many mistakes, but abandoning you wasn't one of them. Indicating she's never... She never abandoned her. She's always been present. Correct. You can take that a couple ways, but I'm just pointing it out. She says that. Long before your grandfather tricked... Tatiana, I created someone who could be there. You know, in terms of, you know, be present. Raymond Reddington. No one knew Reddington was dead, which meant Katarina could create him. What if he was real? I could use the story to construct him and watch you from afar. So what do you think that means, constructed? In Troy's world. Troy's little red arena world. You hear that, what do you think? I mean, that's, a, I mean, actually, do you think heard, clone, do you think this could actually go sci-fi? Because you do have, you know, Eisendrath involved as well. I don't think so. Cause you know, I'd be pissed. Clones and twins make me leave. Yeah, no, I think this is something that could go one of two ways. So I don't think that anything at this point is still confirmed um, with the theory or without the theory. I think this is literally a, she became Reddington. One possible solution constructed four years that she was off the grid that, that Raymond Reddington, the Naval officer was missing between 91 and 95 until he popped up on the radar and Donald wrestler started chasing him down. Um, so that's a lot of time to recover from surgery and procedures and procedures and surgeries that you have to do in order to go through a construction to make that happen. She could also say like, Hey, we have a network family of spies. Let's go find somebody that wants to volunteer. <laughs> and then that volunteer, did exactly the same thing. Went disappeared for four years, construction, surgeries, plastic surgery, and then literally turned into Raymond Reddington. So both are very plausible and very um, much could happen. And that four year gap definitely helps with the fact that there had to have been multiple surgeries in order to make it happen one way or the other. And this is a man's world plays and that's either really on the nose or great. <laughs> Red herring. <laughs> a great red herring. It can really go either way in that respect. Uh, we'll see. All right. So a perfect double wasn't needed. Just needed the information. 13 packets of information that could blackmail anyone. So an intelligence network was built with one intent. To keep Liz safe and also keep Katarina hidden. That was mentioned in the last episode. At the expense of people she loved. You're my mother, but you let someone else watch over me. Let me believe you're dead when you're alive. Who is Reddington? And then, of course, we go back to present time. But we're going to pause right there. So you got all that. You got the whole episode. You're getting to it. I want a couple things. Okay, number one. I will tell you that now I'm sure many, many people that feel very strongly that Red Arena is accurate are going to come out of the woodwork (laughs) <laughs> and say they've been thinking about this for a long time. I will 100% vouch. I've been very ad- very active in this fan base for a long time. Troy is the very first person I ever heard put this together. I, you know, true or not, whatever it ends up being, it's still very commendable that he was one of the first people that I ever heard mention the Red Arena theory. All right, we, you know, we probably shouldn't call it Red Arena. We probably should call Red is Katarina, or Katarina is Red. I just feel like it's more respectful well originally Um, it was called the mother theory yeah it was called the mother theory you know and then people ran with it and you know you you got a lot of play with that it got a lot of publicity and in fact i think entertainment weekly heard about it they asked boca camp about it so it got some press there he came on our show you know or we had daniel knopf on our show and you mentioned that and you could tell that created some (sighs) some excitement and then um, obviously we had boca camp on many times and da 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 so I'm saying all of that to say that, you know, whatever you personally think, you listening, uh, I think it's an it, it's kind of cool, you know, as somebody that's been on this podcast for a long period of time, right, wrong, whatever I am, I'm I think it's very cool that you called this so early, and I want to make sure that if you are right, if they do some day ever freaking confirm it, that that you get, you know. I realize there's nobody that likes to be right more than Troy. But on the same token, when you're right, you're right. When you call something on the left field and you're very <laughs> detailed with the reasons why you're doing that, I think you should be commended for that. And I know for a fact that you were the first one that made this 
popular that popularized this whole theory. You know, there's a reason why I think you have a hospital named after you on the show. I think there's a reason why Boken Camp really respects you in, in many ways. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you've made this theory work and you popularized it and you've been able to explain it without being insulting. And it's important because of the specifics of the topic. So, you know, I just, this is not a Tom reference. This is just Troy. I, I feel it's not confirmed, but after watching this episode, I have a hard time, <laughs> hard time, you know, believing that red is not Katarina. That Katarina is not red. I, I really just, I really feel like, okay. And I will say, you know, I've said in the past and I'll say it again. I have issues with hidden and hiding being words that are thrown around in the show to, if this ends up being accurate, a hundred percent, I have problem with those words being chosen because of the groups that you're talking about have spent their whole lives making sure that they're not hidden, that they're living as, as themselves, as they're being seen for themselves. So when you're talking about someone who does trans, uh, transition to them, it's very important. And I realize it's a TV show, but on the same token, it's a very real thing. And psychologically, it's very important that we respect that, that they have to be some presented in a way that they also feel this way. They feel this is who they are. And I think the show has done enough to start planting the seeds. I still think there's a lot of work they need to do if they want to make that a reality, if, if that is the reality. Um, you know, I want to sleep like I did when I was a boy. That's a very important line. If that is the case, because that says Brett always thought he was a boy. Like he doesn't see himself as Katarina, a woman, you know, and it's not just because my dad, you know, that my mom understood me. I think that's planting the seed. All that stuff works and it does help that portion of the story that I've always had a problem with, which is why I've always kind of said, eh, I don't like it because I don't think network TV is going to do it and they're not going to do it right. And I don't want them to do this wrong if you're going to do it. And you know what, 10 years ago might've seemed a little easier to do something like that than it would be now. And you know, da 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 da. I think they're planting the seeds and they're trying to make, make up that difference. And that will work a lot better for me if that ends up being the case. But I've never felt more convinced that you were right as I do now. So how did you feel all that? That was a long thing to say. I'm very proud of you, Troy. Um, <laughs> if you're right, if you're wrong, I'm going to reflect back on this episode and be like, dumbass, you <laughs> dumb, dumb, you are so <laughs> stupid, but I'm going to assume at this point that you're right. Cause I feel like there is enough here to, to nod to you're correct on this. How does that feel to you? Do you feel like it was as confirmed as it could be without them saying it at this point? Do you feel like you're not as sure as you once were? Do you feel like you're more sure than you once were? Where are you at now? I mean, I'm not going to lie. I had a giant smile on my face the entire time I watched this episode because it was like, <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Like literally down the line. It's like, we've said this, we've said this, we've said this. Here's the connection points all the way down the road. Um, I, I just want to go on record that if you, if you stick your finger up, you'll feel the wind on one side. No, every single time, right? But it's like sometimes you just got to just take a st stupid, wild guess. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I could say like I called this so early because it literally was a stupid, wild guess. So how the theory came to be originally was we were on a network called TV Talk before we were on Golden Spiral Media. And we did a preview show, which unfortunately has been lost to the archives. We only had the, the pilot episode, Rocco Zamani, um, which you do have in the feed. You can go back and listen from the beginning and hear uh, Dave Dreher, who was my original co-host on the show for season one before Aaron joined in season two. And in that first ever podcast that we do not have access to anymore, there was a guy, he was a, a newspaper writer in Nebraska, and he interviewed John Bokenkamp. I remember this, so I, I'll confirm. I remember this. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the guy basically was like, so tell me about your writing process. So John's like, I, I sit in bed at night with his wife, Kathy, you know, bounce ideas off of her. I don't really have a writing partner. And he writes story. And then one of the, the quotes was that he writes stories for strong female leads, strong female characters. That's John's MO. That's his writing style, um, which we obviously see because he wrote uh, Taking Lives with Angelina Jolie, uh, the movie. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
were like, oh, like that's cool. Like he's he's gonna write for for uh, Megan Boone's character, right? She was brought on the show first. You know, James Spader came very late in the process. So this is a story about Megan Boone, Liz Keen, and her FBI superpowers. Because James Spader came on so late in the scene, um, Kiefer Sutherland was the one that was actually originally scheduled to play Raymond Reddington, and then that all fell through or didn't want to do the deal or whatever it was uh, at the end of the day. Before the show even aired, Dave and I speculated on wouldn't it be cool if it was the Scooby-Doo theory where you go through the whole show and then Raymond Reddington pulls the mask off at the end and it's Kiefer Sutherland the whole time. That was the origination of the imposter theory before the show even started. And then as season one went along and we got to Ansel Garrick in part two and it's the, you know, are you my father? And he says, no, like we just went in that moment, like, Oh my gosh, wouldn't it be cool if when he takes the mask off, it was actually Liz's mom. And we were just like, that'll never happen. That's so stupid. <laughs> we just kind of laughed it off and we were like, whatever. Um, we get to the end of season one and you get the whole like your mother's dead. They're sitting on the steps. We get to season two, episode four um, with Naomi and he's like, well, you look a little bit different, not as different as you. And then she's talking to Liz about how women like no women and Raymond Reddington's not who you think he is. And then we were like, nope, nope, we're back on the train. Like that is Liz's mom 100%. So, I mean, what literally was like a kind of side joke became the mother theory and there's a lot in this episode tonight. And I think the one thing that was really great about this episode in particular was if it is confirmed, cause it's not, it's open for interpretation, but there are things in this episode that you sit there and you go, this is what makes the blacklist so great because Katarina says things like, you know, I had to sleep with men and women. And then as you hear in a little bit, we have uh, Spader delivering as Raymond Reddington in the present, a very similar line where he basically had a glutton for women and men. So those are the types of things you look for in the blacklist. Um, the visuals of the bus stop where you saw Katarina handing the bag over to uh, Yvonne Stepanoff. And then you saw created Reddington, younger version, created Reddington handing off a bag to Stepanoff at the same exact bus stop. So that's when you just sit there and you go, ah, oh, those are those little tiny clues. And you go, that's just fantastic. And then you go back to things like uh, Mato, right? You go back to Kate May. We actually saw the Kate May. We saw the risotto episode uh, or the or the, uh, the mushroom, the table. Like I was once here a very long time ago, a different person than you, right? We saw that image actually in this episode this evening. Um, the, uh, the motto comes to mind. It's like when you put that baby in my arms, you know, all those years ago, I swore to protect her. Uh, smells like dad's Wagoneer. And then Dom has a Wagoneer literally parked in the freaking driveway. I mean, it, it's all that little stuff along the way that you go, oh, I can, I can see it. I can put it together. It tracks the whole way through. And then when the whole Belgrade thing happened and Katarina was a fake, it was like, this, there's just no other way this can go at this point unless it's a completely random third person. So um, I think. How would you feel about that at this point? If, if it was if if this third person that showed up because it, that feels like a red herring it really does it feels like so that ah that's gonna be enough to put people off of this theory I don't th I don't think it will but you know how, how do you feel about that like if it came to be that third person is actually Red Reddington like this this actually Katarina is the MacGuffin is the it was a red herring is the one that throw you off like how would you feel about that would you be okay with it as long as it works or would you if, struggle with it because you're so ingrained in this I mean I mean. I mean, at this point, it's like, oh my gosh, like how could it not be Katarina is Raymond Reddington? Like, how could that not be given the stuff we saw in the episode tonight? Mm -hmm. um, if it was a third party, if they actually did create a third person became Reddington, C. Duke would be the only person I think I would accept at this point because C. Duke seems like he would have been part was of mentioned like family. one time. I know, but it's a character that was mentioned. It's a character that Reddington was spying on, was involved with. You know, so he could be part of this spy family that Dom was raising. Sure. Um, if it was a completely random person given tonight's episode, I would be super mad because I think the the only reason you bring in a third party to be that person at this point is to save face with the community. Like you just can't go there because you're getting backlash from you know the transgender community and how it was all played out and how it was done. So it'd almost be like a you know political cop out at that point if you made it a different person. 
And I think that would well, be the same token. They do. If, if that is the way they go, which I mean, if that is the way they go, which it does look like that to me, like at this point, like I'll be the pay, hey, I'll eat crow. I'll, I'll, I'll eat some humble pie, whatever it is. I mean, it feels very much like red is Katarina Rostova to me. I mean, by the end of this episode, I'm like, you know, I've always, I've never ruled it out. I think you and I've talked about this a hundred times. I've yeah. never ruled it out, but there's definitely where I'm like, I don't subscribe to it. I just don't subscribe to it. But there's definitely been moments where I'm like, I don't know, that kind of thing. Every time Red would have those Dom conversations, that's when I would always come back to him. Well, maybe he is Katarina. Maybe it is. Like, but part of me, or a big portion of me, was always like, no, because number two things. One, network TV. Network TV would never do it because they'd always want to stay away from anything that edgy, right? And and I want to say it's not edgy because, oh, look how edgy. You're making a, you know, a master criminal um, a trans, which essentially is what the character would be. It's, it's in terms of if you do it wrong, it comes across as you're just trying to be edgy, but you don't understand someone who's actually trans. Right. So capitalizing to, on something just to capitalize on something. Yes. Yeah. Exploiting, exploiting a real person's um, personal, personal journey for just the benefit of storytelling, just for dramatic effect. And I, I'm not a fan of that for something as, as. Trans people have fought their whole lives for the right to be seen and accepted for who they are. So I'm very, very adamant that there has to be respect there in, in terms of that because they have to know that if you're telling that story, it's because that's the character that, that uh, that's who the character wanted to be the whole that's who the character was the whole time. Right. You know, that's who Katarina was the whole time. Now, obviously, she's a spy. She's trained to ignore her own personal soul. But obviously, her mom knew different. Her mom knew her better. So there are little little nuggets that can paint that picture. And I think they still have work to do, like I said. But it's very important to me that they do do that because story or not, it's an, it's an important factor of that. You know, otherwise, you end up kind of insulting the community if you don't do it right. That's why I thought, so the whole time I'm thinking, network TV would never touch that. I could see Netflix doing it. I could see Hulu or somebody, you know, or some streamer doing it because they they have edgier material. HBO, definitely. But NBC, pfft, never. Never. Which is why I've always been kind of, you know, that's, that's not going to be a theory, Troy. You're out of your mind. It's not going to happen. Network TV would never touch that. And I know a lot of people are going to hang on John Bokekamp's line where he said, well, yes, I have, I've always had the ending in mind if the network would let me do it. That's what a lot of people are going to lean on. I've always said that can mean a lot of things because Boken Camp speaks in circles a lot of, <laughs> a lot of times. Uh, but uh, in this respect, I would agree with him. I would be very surprised the network would let him do it. So that's always why I've been against it. So, But watching this episode, it feels like, okay, all those, so many blanks have been confirmed. So many aspects have been reiterated. It'd be hard for me to see how you throw a third party in there at this point. Like I just, because eight years in, we would have to have met them by now. I mean, f for everything we just saw, I think we have to have seen the character. And I don't think the red herring third person there, the night of the fire is really enough. Now that person could 100% be, and they could definitely work that out later. I just feel like it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Red is Katarina is... I'm as close to confident saying that as I've ever been to any theory. But now you've been a, an avid watcher of the show, super mm -hmm. analyzed, doing the podcast. What about someone that maybe is a, a watcher, but not like four or five, six times watching these episodes? What does your wife think? Uh, <laughs> so Red's Katarina. That's literally what she said. Now, granted, she's heard you forever. Right. You know, so, and, and she, she loves Troy and she thinks he's a little nutty sometimes with his theories. Um, but she, she, she definitely said, so Troy was right. Troy was right. Yo, he's going to love hearing that. Troy was right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, uh, but yeah, that's, that's exactly what she said. She's, she's not on board with that. She's never been on board with that theory. She's always, you know, and mostly because she's very casual. Like you said, she, she's not watching and dissecting every little thing. She's not doing a podcast. She's not watching it three times. She's only watching it the, you know, one time. But as soon as it aired, she's she's just like, right as Katarina. Yep. I mean, <laughs> is it really, I think at one point she said, is there really anything else that makes sense at this point? 
Now, did she was she happy with that reveal or not reveal but um, interpretation? She or, or was she like, no, like she I'm never gonna watch like, Blacklist again. This is stupid. No, 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 it wasn't like that. Well, she might. She's <laughs> she's very frustrated by it not being answered. I will tell you that. Like as a casual viewer, she she's fine. If Red's Katarina, that's fine. But she she said she's really tired of this being drug out. She just wants to get back to Blacklisters, and you know she she felt. She did say she she really felt bad for for Liz the character because the show did kind of a, did her dirty in a way by by Katarina <sighs> by really not clearing that up like fifteen episodes ago you know in, in a way because it made it really made fans hate Liz this year I mean there was always that section that disliked her but fans came to hate her this year because she was against Red all season and now. She was against Red, Dom died, all this stuff. And it's it's all because Red couldn't tell her the truth, but nobody sees that. Everybody's just blaming Liz for it. You know what yeah. I mean? That makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, like, like we said, I think dragging it out into season eight, I think definitely hurt the Liz character up quite a bit. So I'm really excited to see kind of what happens next week. Now she has this information. She still doesn't know who is Reddington, but... I think what happens next in the sequence as we come back to present time really showcases how Red feels about Liz and what he'll do for Liz um, as we finish up Townsend's arc. Hmm. It's pretty crazy though. I mean, it's gotta, it's gotta be kind of, kind of weird to get to this moment where you're like, huh, I guess it works. I mean, I'm sure you already felt that way, but when you see everything kind of mapped out, it really feels like, at some point, can can you agree with this? Why not just confirm whoever Red is at this point? Like, I just, I don't think it's something that can, that at this moment, when you see all you saw, you need to really wait till the end of the show. I think we've seen enough. Just, just do it already. Yeah, like we and, said, like you could give the reveal and it could open up a ton of more, a ton more questions. Like, what about Yvonne stepping off? You know, what does he do? Like, where does he, who does he work for? Now that this information is out there, does someone come after Yvonne and they have to go say, you know, save him, you know, because he's, he's his old dearest friend and you can have a whole season about saving Stepanov you know, for season nine, potentially. Uh, there, there's just a lot you could do with that answer. So I think that, yeah, part of me is like, it's art. Art should be open for interpretation. I think it's great. Spinning top, Inception, the whole thing. Um, on the other side of the coin, it's also like you could give the answer and still keep the show going. Mm hmm. So and I think it's long past time for that. Hmm. Now that said, all that said, are you leaving yourself any room for wiggle for a year from now, two years from now, you finding out that third person is actually who Red is and there's a different connection that we don't know and Katarina had a brother the whole time where she created a clone in her basement. <laughs> I mean I mean there's so much in this episode that points it to one direction that it's like, gosh, if it went another way. I don't know. I might not recover. I was already there once in season six. I can't go back to that dark place. <laughs> well, here's one thing I, I want to add. Okay. I think this is very important that we should say this because so many people I, I've seen this, they kind of become bullies of sorts in terms of fan communities, like whatever camp you're sure. in, I've seen them across the board. Don't be that, that person. Just don't be, you know, it, I've seen, I've seen people, we're going to make a list of people that were against us uh, on theories so we can rub their rubber noses in it or something like that. Do, like not, when, do not be that person. Don't do that. I mean, that, that makes you not, not only not better, that makes you worse than the people you're complaining about. So just, just take the high road. Always take the high road. You know, I think people thought we were going to sit here and fight and I was going to be all sad and mopey and you're just going to be rubbing my nose in dirt or something. But I, I don't even think they, they, obviously are paying attention when they want to listen to the podcast because I've never ruled it out. <laughs> so it's not like I'm against it or I hate it. There's just certain parameters I had for it to work. And they met a couple of them in this episode, but don't be, don't be that person. You know, there's a, there's a faction of fans, the Lizington fans, I'm sure are going to be very upset with this whole scenario. For sure. Uh, because I do think the episode points heavily that, that this is, that red is Katarina, you know, don't rub it in their faces. They've been as beholden to their theory as you have to yours. 
or that people have been beholden to the imposter theory or that people have been beholden to the uncle theory or spy camp. I mean, there's all kinds of theories out there. Time traveler, alien. Time, I didn't even know about time travel, but hey, if you're on that train, you know, choo-choo. Just, just, just remember, they're just as passionate about the show as you are. So maybe instead of like making them feel bad that they didn't guess something that you think is wrong, maybe just like, hey, you know what? Let's all let's all enjoy the show together again. Let's get back to that because that that's what makes the show fun. Yeah, that's I why mean, I love the blacklist because the fan community is crazy and network shows don't have this much anymore. They don't alienate the people that yeah. are still there. I, I think maybe Fringe was probably the last big network show that had a giant fan community like this. I mean, Timeless had a fan community, but the, it's small. Some of the CW shows, maybe the Arrowverse, you know, had a, had a good sized fan community. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of Arrowverse shows here on Golden Spiral Media. But I mean, at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter whose theory was right. What matters is, is that I got friends in New York, New Jersey, uh, Wales, Spain. Um, I'm, I'm finding a, a friend in Tennessee in a couple weeks when I go down to Tennessee. There's a blacklist watcher. I'm finding new people to find the blacklist even now. I mean, we had. We had people that listened to 167 episodes of this podcast during the break between November and February. And I'm just like, I'm just amazed, first of all, that you'd want to listen to the two of us, Nimrods, talk that much because we can't even stand ourselves talking to each other that much. Especially and, this deep into my drink. Yeah. And, and we're friends, right? You guys aren't friends with us. Like, we don't know who you are. We've become like, you know, loyal listeners and and podcast hosts but some people have been friends with some people we've we've made yeah. really great friends with over like rory like rory was just a guy who was like i'm gonna make funny clips about troy and aaron because they're <laughs> they're ridiculous next thing you know like rory's like on a train coming out to a blacklist event where he literally came on the train went to the event and got his ass back on the train to go home yeah. i mean that's that's to, to me that's dedication but it's crazy that that's and the he kind still of, didn't and some people love him a lot more than me like Some they're like Aaron's do. a dick. I like sure Rory. Do. Sure. Um, and I get know, we, that. I do had, get that. People. Anybody that says that, I understand you. I I mean, you. I'm thinking of um, like who are some of that like Nancy, uh, Nancy Joycom or Jeannie Johnson or Allie Blacklist Tumblr. You know, we had uh, pizza and, and lunch with her out in New York. Um, you know, Amir. I mean, has been a friend of the show. Like we've talked to Amir on the side and done some stuff with Amir. I mean. Like that's what's cool about the show. Like, don't worry about your theory. Don't worry if you're right or wrong. Worry about the fact that we got season nine and we all love Red and we all love his stories. We all love the crazy shit that he does. So let's go ahead and just like sit back and go like, yes, we are all finally in the same camp again. We're in the camp of go forward and catch bad guys. I think that's going to be great. And I, I can't wait to talk to all of you about it as the show continues. And remember, I am Team Liz still. And she got shortchanged and I still feel like red should get his ass kicked because really this whole season is his fault. That's well, all I'm knows? saying. Maybe he gets his ass kicked next week. We still got another episode. Could be. To go. Got a whole nother episode. Oh, you know what? That reminds me. We got to get back to present time. Oh, if, doo, if you're doo, done doo, riding, doo, riding doo. the, uh, black and white choo -choo. train. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the, the red train. Let's get back to the present time. Townsend shows up. Bunch of people die. Liz is shot. It was pretty sad. It was pretty random, but you saw how red immediately jumped to her defense. She's able to save her and Red's life by shooting Townsend, which was really cool. Shooting at Townsend. Dembe and Red and Liz go into a hatch designed to survive nuclear fallout from a 20 megaton bomb in the Cold War. Down there, Red and Townsend have a final battle of words until Red gasses the place, lights the gas on fire, making a new dish for Dembe's restaurant, the Crispy Neville. Red does a few parting lines for Townsend, though. It does have a few parting lines for Townsend, though. My appetite was voracious. As the Soviet Union fell, I gorged myself on information, money, weapons, women, men. A Soviet nest is where the Ruskies could take cover in order to repel ugly Americans. And here we are. You're American. You're ugly. And I'm about to repel you. I freaking love that. I thought that was fantastic. And then he's like, you're going to, I'm going to take, I'm going to, you're not going to burn this down. You're going to take, that's the source of your power. And then Red says, the source of my power is here, and she won't be destroyed by the likes of you. And then poof, blows his ass up. This felt like a freaking season finale. Did it not? It sure did. But we it have a whole like, episode it felt, left. It felt, it, felt like a show, it felt like a show finale, to be quite honest. They could have just ended it right there. 
It would have been like, that's great. <laughs> that would have been kind of cool. Mother and daughter so, reunited again in a basement that they can't get out of. So I guess, I mean, we were talking about other cool stuff, but we, I guess we haven't talked about Neville. Neville dies here. So this is the end of his story, unless he somehow, you know, gets the same burn scars and walks out of there nice and crispy. What did you uh, think of the ending of Neville? Uh, I thought this was a, a great, like his, I just love that he's like stuck to his hubris all the way up into the end. It's like, you know, a, a confession on the deathbed is such a great story, but you're still going to die. Like he just, he's just not going to let it go. And you thought that maybe even before, idiot. you know, he gets shot, you know, he's having that conversation, like Red's holding Liz. He's still not pulling the trigger. He's still not pulling the trigger. He's just, his hubris has got the best of him because he's a crazy person. He is a nut job. And nut jobs never, ever win in the end. So I thought when all of a sudden the gas starts coming and the giant, whatever that was, you know, uh, campfire lighter <laughs> comes out of the ceiling. <laughs> it literally looks like one of those things that you light your fireplace with um, and then torches the pl- I mean, it was like, it was such a great ending for him. He's like, damn, I, I lost. <laughs> it was, but hey, at least he can sleep in peace now. The whole, the whole Red's delivery of you're ugly or you're American, you're ugly. And I'm about to repel you. I just, I freaking, I laugh so hard. I'm like, that's the way you end an episode. That's the way you just blow his ass up credits. I love that. Even though it was, you know, it's kind of like, oh, of course. I mean, we're going to go to gunfights when the who question c- comes up. I mean, when we're adamant about the who question for a while, Liz was throwing it back. They're like, no, nah, no, nah, I want to know who. No, 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 hold off. I got to stall long enough for Townsend to get here is basically what Red was doing. And then. It, I still loved it. I still thought that was a fantastic ending. And That's honestly, ending. one of the one of my favorite finishing moves for a bad guy in the show. Yeah, total Mortal Kombat. That stuff. That was awesome. <laughs> Finish him. <laughs> but awesome I mean, the, these lines are important, right? The the whole my appetite was voracious. Money, yeah. weapons, women, men. Like we heard Katarina say that earlier in the episode. Um, the fact that you're an American, you're ugly. I'm about to repel you because this is where the Soviets hung out. So he's confirming that he's kind of Russian uh, in that statement. And then of course the source of my power is here. Like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like, oh, as a parent, you're just like, oh, my heart hurts. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. I mean, honestly, that that to me, red parent more than just about anything. Yeah. Yeah, it, it felt like to me, it felt like this whole thing was to, we're gonna come as close as we can to saying who he is without actually saying who he is. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of people that are going to not see that or not want to see that, but I don't see how you don't at this point. That's why I'm very curious to see what the poll is going to say next week. Like if they think that the Red Arena theory is confirmed or not by this episode. Yeah, I'm really, really interested. I mean, that's why it's our question. But you've got a few more questions you want to go through. So this is on you. Take it away. Well, I mean, just like in general, um, season up to this point, this episode, did you like it? Did you not like it? Did you like the black and white? Do you like how it all put together? Mm. And what didn't you like about the episode also? Yeah, I, like I, I told um, John, we weren't recording, but when I, when I told John, I'm a huge fan of when you use black and white, especially for flashback effect. Uh, Dead Again is a movie that I absolutely adore. Kenneth Branagh movie, you should find it. And I'm a little tipsy right now, so don't, you know, don't, don't bank on anything I say at this point. It's being rational. <laughs> but I love that movie. I love this aesthetic. I, I really thought, like, I hate exposition in a show. I feel like if you're if you're gonna if you have to do a major information dump at some point, you probably weren't telling the story right. Is usually how I look at things. I think that they handled it very cleverly in many respects because, like I said earlier, so much of the information is stuff we already knew. It's just that they were re-examining it and putting the pieces together. And I think because we watched the show so much, we knew most of the information. You know, it's just some things were confirmed finally and we needed those confirmed or some, a couple, we, we had most of the pieces, but we didn't have that final piece. And now we have that final piece. And I think it all worked really well. I think it was very smart. It was a way to tell a lot of answers in one episode and not bore the hell out of me. And that's hard to do. So I, I thought, I love this episode. I thought it was great. I really did. Not just because we got answers and da, 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 da. I just, I, I like that we got something different and. There's some clever, there's a lot of clever here. And I love the ending with Townsend. I think that was fantastic. Yeah, I know some people are like, where's the musical episode? When are we going to get the musical episode? <laughs> if I anybody's that- saying that, stop it. All right. <laughs> there's certain shows where that works for. I don't see this being one of them. 
But I think this was it. This was a musical episode in a way that it just, mm. it literally felt like a painted art as it went along through the whole course of the thing. I, like I said, I love the camera rotation as the characters are revealed, like Liz's head is spinning and we're, like, and we're just spinning right along. I, I thought that was just a brilliant camera trick to, to pull that off. I thought that was just super, super fantastic. And then just, you know, bringing in the old clips so that people can realize like, oh yeah, this was actually woven through the entire time. Like we we did not miss a beat. Like it, it's all here. Like you just got to go back. I I, I had a, a conversation with a person about like fan theories and how you want to think of the sh the TV shows and art and things. And it's like, do you do you get a puzzle, and do you put the puzzle together without ever looking at the front of the box? No, you first look at the front of the box and then you build the puzzle. So what this episode is is this episode is showing you the front of the box. Mm. Now you can go back and look at seasons one through eight in its entirety, knowing what the picture looks like and build the puzzle and find all the clues and the drops that were along the way, because you're not going to just go into the show blind or the puzzle blind and build the puzzle without knowing what the front of the box looks like. So I think it's interesting to now, now that you know these answers and whatever interpretation you have of this particular episode for your theory, you can go back to the show now and go, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Duh. <laughs> And one thing that I thought was really cool is, you know, a lot of times when you're getting a show that's kind of laying out its pieces and, and the pieces don't connect, you know, there's like, uh, what? I mean, that's a stretch that all of this tracks with the show. So I'll give them, I'll give them complete credit because the X-Files is a show that I absolutely adore and their pieces do not connect. There are so many freaking loopholes in their, in their trajectory that it just stopped making sense after a long period of time these these check like all this stuff is information that we knew so we know for a fact it checks because we've talked about it so many times you know so it was nice to to see that all right you put a lot of time and care into making sure that this story came out straight and right and i so i, I love that aspect of it yeah i applaud it's a it, i mean like john even said like there was some stuff yeah that we absolutely like godwin page totally had to make it up because we had to figure out a way to get from a to b so like we don't have the entire thing planned, but we have the big things planned. And when you go back and you look at the big signposts, everything right. was right down the line. And that's hard. There's a lot of shows that don't get that opportunity. I mean, look at like we said, debris manifest, Zoe's playlist, like just at NBC alone, all the all the disasters that happened with the cancellations in those past two weeks. Um, there's just people that won't get answers to stuff. And there's other shows that try to be creative and just aren't. You know, that just fall flat on their face. I mean, I would even say like Orphan Black is a great show great show tatiana mislani is amazing as an actress in the show by the time the show was over i was kind of like you know it, it works but i'm not in love with the ending like it just mm. it, it looked like they like had to force an ending or get to an ending faster than they wanted to it just this to me feels like a button a bow a present wrapped up you're just like christmas morning and you're like oh my gosh like it's exactly what i wanted and we've got one more episode, so there might be even more stuff. There might be even more stuff. And we got a whole the new season. This is the beginning. That's the, the beginning. ending. We so. got the ending. Yeah. Still coming up next week. So what do you expect to see next week? Uh, especially given information that came out today. Is this where I can say it out loud? I, I think we can say like, anybody that doesn't want to know the information that came out today, this is another spoiler warning for you. Um, maybe jump ahead, you know, two, three, four minutes in the podcast. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's, it's been out there. It's public. It's been in every trade magazine. If you haven't seen it, you have to be living under a rock, which is good for you because then you can enjoy the show the way you want to enjoy the show. Um, and you could probably explain how it's not red arena now, you know, <laughs> because you've been living under a rock. You're like, oh, you guys didn't even talk about this option. Your heads are so stuck in this red is Katarina theory. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Uh, so the news is that according to deadlines reported by deadline that Megan Boone is leaving the show after season eight wraps up. She won't be in season nine or she won't be a regular in season nine for sure. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I know she got gut shot in this episode. I don't think Liz is going to die. If that's what people are worried about personally, this is my personal opinion. I have, we haven't seen this episode. We have no idea. I, I think they're just going to figure out her exit. Like that. That's what I think is happening. I think it's a big factor, you know, why we got, the episode we just got, you know, to give all the details, I think Liz as a character is probably going to exit and they're going to set it up. So red still ha helps the task force in order to keep Liz in hiding or safe. Yeah. I That's mean, the whole, I the whole purpose of the blacklist was to 
keep your mother hidden and to keep you safe. Now that we know that potentially, depending on interpretation, that the mother is in the open, maybe it's like the purpose of the blacklist is to keep Liz safe, right? And Liz has to go do something and be part of Red's network or, you know, men, maintain the banana plantation and hang out with <laughs> Gerard and whoever else is out there. Well, she doesn't have an interest in running the whole thing like she she made that painfully obvious in this episode so i i think it'll be more her and agnes can go away be hidden be safe go to that private island you know that yep. red talked about in one episode and then do something along those lines i think i think it's going to be more in line with that because there's still one giant piece that has kind of been forgotten about since liz came back on the show and that's red sick when did red magically get healed yeah they really haven't talked about that in a while right so maybe that comes up next week. Maybe there's something like, hey, by the way, now that you know all this stuff, I'm dying. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I need and, you I, to, and I need you to help me so that I don't die. So can I you go do, do this thing? And that's how she gets off the show. I do wonder if, like, does that mean Megan Boone will never come back, like, from the finale? Like, because I really hope whenever the series does end, she does come back from the finale. I, yeah, I hope like that. She's, she's not going to be a regular on the show next year. Does that mean that she's not be in an episode or two here and there? Sure. Yeah, I mean, we don't. We don't I, really I think they're... If, I, if I'm the writers, I write it in a way that leaves it open for her to return. That's what I would do as well. I mean, yeah. we're just speculating, so we'll find out next week. That's where I'm at currently with it. Yeah. But yeah, Megan is not going to be a regular cast member for season nine. That was the big news. Hey, we'll see what happens. You know, we'll Let's talk more about it next week. We'll talk sure. more about it next week. But I want to take a quick second to say thank you to those of you that are supporting the show by going to Patreon. It's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash the Blacklist GSM. It's a horror reason we're on YouTube. Thanks to you guys. Special big thanks to honorary Blacklister Patricia. Also, special shout out to our task force members, Judy and Sharon, Rory, Karen, Bobby, Jens, and now Mary, all official task force members. All those people receive cool gifts from us, and you can get a cool gift as well for donating to the $20 level or higher. If you want a cool t-shirt or a coffee mug, man, you know you do. You don't have to stay at that level forever. Just a few months to get the cool gifts. And like Aaron said, big thanks to all of you that chipped in five bucks, especially last week for the John interview, putting us over our goal of $500 to make a video podcast. So you can see Aaron and I in our smiling faces. And our hats. And our hats. And our shirts. And uh, my background. Yeah, shirts. Black Puppy! Stuff. I'm a little so, drunk. Sorry. Super, super <laughs> awesome that all of you were there and made that happen. So um, let's keep it there. So uh, don't just uh, give your five bucks and then decide to dump out next month. Let's keep it you know, sponsored so we can do all video for season nine because that would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, this podcast will be up on YouTube as soon as we can get it edited and up. Uh, next week's will be up on YouTube. Maybe we even do that one live um, and do some fan interaction. I think that would be kind of fun as well. Um, but we got a whole other season going. So go over to P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That's patreon.com slash the blacklist GSM. Click the dollar sign in your podcast app or the link in the show notes. Fill the fedora. Help us out. Get some awesome rewards for yourself. Special Agent Intel, as mentioned, will be held until next week so we can hear all of your thoughts on this episode, all the reveals, all the interpretations of Nicello, as well as the ending, the season finale. Hope you had a blast this week. And if not, just let us know that as well. And that's going to conclude this discussion. So now is the time to recommend the blacklist. And obviously, I am starting to slur. The whiskey is coming in thick. <laughs> now, so now is the time to recommend the blacklist to your friend your enemy your neighbor and when you do please also recommend that listen and subscribe to the blacklist exposed podcast all the case profiles can be found at the blacklist and everywhere a great podcast can be heard and no that isn't radio i'm getting drunk i need to go <laughs> for more great aaron and troy hijinks and what aaron's <laughs> favorite drinks are you can follow on your favorite social media outlet i'm at troy heinrichs he's at aaron smirks Together we are at the Blacklist GSM. Talk about the show, the podcast, or where you like to trade secret info with your friends. And you can listen to Troy's joining me on the Hollywood Outsider podcast for several episodes for we the are. next uh, foreseeable future. So thanks for that. Yeah, this week we were talking about um, reality TV. So yes. um, do you like it? Do you not like it? And what do you love about it? So definitely check that episode, out. next episode, we're going to talk about fan theories. Oh, I wonder why. <laughs> I don't know why. Big thanks for listening. Don't forget to uh, answer our profiling question. Do you believe that the theory that Red is Katerina Rostova was confirmed on this episode? My God, emotions are about to get high. That's right. And uh, just so everybody knows, we are putting this episode out for both the patrons and the regulars immediately after the show ends. 
So, so huge. Um, it'll be a, a real, real joy to hear what you all think of what we think of this. And, hey, uh, and all you people that call me dicks, <laughs> you. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is that the alcohol? I can't tell. I can't tell. But whatever. Let's have a let's let's head out of here. Because yeah, that's really going out. All right, guys. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you next week for the ending. <laughs> Take care. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie, right? We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at 5 Popcorn. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.